You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. I feel like we left a lot on the table in the last episode talking about what Chris Getz could do right now and what he he could do to make me feel more comfortable about him in the position as general manager. And I want to get into it today. But before we get into anything that has to do with the team long term or what they should be doing or how they should be identifying players, Ed, can I I just ask you another what the heck is Pedro doing question? Oh, sure. Yeah, I I was going to say we left a lot on the table because part of the table was under my fat rolls. (laughs) So you just didn't see it there. You can hide a lot in there. Uh, You really can. Here's the thing. Corey Lee's up. He's one of the guys acquired who is going to be in the mix to be a catcher next year on this team. I don't know why Yasmani Grandal, who's old, getting older, lost his power, eight home runs basically at this point in the year. I don't see. He he may get the double digits. He may not. An OPS around 650 and an average around 230. I don't know why that walks back in the door next year if you're trying to compete in 2024 or even build for 2025. So I want to see the other catchers behind the plate catching. And I also want to see them in situations when we can learn a little bit about them and teach them something at the big league level. I want to see them get opportunities. And I don't understand why in a situation where you're looking for Lee to get a hit in a big moment, when you have a team that has absolutely no chance of making the postseason and losses actually help you when it comes time to draft next year, why you would pinch hit for him. But then the very next day, you're upset because you didn't like the effort because he lost the ball and didn't run out and out at first base. Like, it, it, it's such a mixed message, and I don't even care about the thing. Like, look, if you think he didn't hustle or he screwed up, you're trying to teach him a lesson, whatever. That's your job as a manager. But Ricky Renteria, at least, would let these guys go out there and try to show they could do something when it wasn't a pressure situation. You're a rebuilding manager, at least for this year and likely next year. No matter what anybody tells us, that's what you are. The young guy's got to get a chance to figure it out. You don't bench him and bring in somebody else as a pinch hitter. You let him go out there and hit and learn something or teach you something about them. Continues to be a mixed message coming from dugout and front office with this team. And it starts back when you have Ricky Renneria in the dugout, and he's a rebuilding manager, and he's a developmental guy, right? And in the front office, you have this idea. This is kind of the last time we were sort of on the same page. You have this idea that these young guys are coming up, we're building a core, we're going to start to compete. But then when it comes time, when they they actually do see some success in the shortened season, Ricky's out, right? Because now you need somebody to take him to the next step. But then clearly the team that's assembled – and the team that Tony La Russa would have liked to have managed aren't the same team. And now you go to Pedro Grafol, which supposedly is the manager for the team that you have, but I think is really hired because Rick Hahn overestimated how much veteran leadership and hustle this guy was going to have. And he was thinking this guy is going to be more about motivation, preparation. So it's entirely possible that Chris Getz is saddled with a manager right now who doesn't understand that he's a rebuilding manager or isn't prepared to be a rebuilding manager and thinks he's a guy that has to prove that he can win games even with a lesser staff, even though, it, like you said, at this point, for this season, it's lost. And and that, I hope, is one of the things that we see Chris Getz do is if he's going to sit there and say, hey, Pedro, I'm willing to give you another shot next year, but here's the deal. Right now, these are the guys that play, and these are not – guys that I want to see in the lineup. And I don't want you pinch hitting for young guys in key situations. I, you know, I can understand doing like a left, right split. If you're going to do something like that, if you're going to sit there and platoon a guy, but yeah, you're right. Letting Corey Lee hit in that position is really, that's what we want to see. Even Ozzy, even when they were competing, frankly, I think Ozzy would let guys go out there and at least try and succeed and wouldn't have a quick leash on him. I'm thinking about like say John Garland, who had always had a very quick hook and, you know, you go into 2005 and he would let him try and work his way out of trouble. And now if he got into more trouble, he was gone. But, you know, you didn't see a whole lot of that where the, the biggest problem I have with Pedro at this point is, is that his motivational stuff rings really hollow because he doesn't follow through with the player on it. Uh, Ozzy was doing that even when they were competing. 
In 05, he was tinkering with the bullpen and giving guys a chance to prove what they could do because he Absolutely. knew they were going to have to do it in the postseason. So I don't think that ever ends. But then here's here's the other point. If if Chris Getz wants him to manage it a certain way and he doesn't get on board immediately, he should just remove him at the end of the year. He should say, you know what? I thought he was going to stick around to the end of the year, but he, you know, now that we've worked with each other, I think I'm going to go in another direction. He has every right to do that. And here's the thing. If Getz is going to come out and publicly say he's the manager next year, then this guy shouldn't be trying to win ball games. He should start planning for next year. And if he doesn't, he's not capable of being the manager of the Chicago White Sox or, I don't know, a minor league baseball team for crying out loud. This episode of Socks in the Basement and every episode of Socks in the Basement brought to you by Cork and Carry at the Park, 33rd in Princeton in the shadow of the ballpark, an award-winning menu of burgers and ballpark favorites. Two-for-one burgers when you dine in on Mondays when it's not a Socks home game on that day. An extensive bar with a rotation of craft beers, familiar favorites, spirits and wines, the best place to bring the family over and feed them beforehand, get together with friends afterwards, and just have a beer and commiserate or talk about this team or whatever you want to do. It's a great atmosphere. However you're going to use it there at Cork and Carry. See more at CorkandCarry.com. You know, it's a perfect example of just not getting it as a coach. M- my kid plays JV hockey, and his freshman year, he was essentially a walk-on. He was like at the bottom of the roster. By the end of the year, he was playing in the playoff game, so he worked his butt off to get himself to that position as a freshman and on a very good team. There was a point late in the year, though, where there's penalty shots that are going to be taken, And winning or losing the game didn't matter in the grand scheme of things. And so the coach of his team sent him and another freshman, and then I want to say a sophomore who was on the team who's never gotten the opportunity, he sent them out to take the penalty shots. He was like, we're going to see what these guys have. And for the first time in their lives, while there's a screaming crowd, we're going to give them the opportunity So that they learn from their mistake. And of course, he didn't do very well. It was the first time he ever took a penalty shot. Afterwards, he was like, Dad, I screwed that up. I'm like, you've never done that before. Right. The coach is doing that because you're at the beginning of your time in the program. And he realizes you need that experience. And he needs to see what you need to work on and what you have in that moment. Right. The only guy that scored out of those three was the kid that was a little bit older. And they won their penalty shot thing. But my my kid and the other the other freshmen, they didn't even have a chance. They didn't even know what they were doing. They were just in there in the spotlight for a moment, but it was a learning moment for them. And that's why you let your young guys who are going to be part of your plan hit when there's a big situation. That that is a disconnect right there by the coach. If, If a coach at a high school level at any sport understands that, Pedro needs to understand it as well. And if he doesn't, Chris Getz should be concerned. Well, and that's also the sustained success or socks sess that we oh, were don't do that. We were don't promised. do that. Yeah. Okay, I won't do that. But but the sustained success, the 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 constant, you know, reinflux of talent that was supposed to happen with this team. One of it comes from actually having talented players in the minor league system, but the other one comes from when you have these moments in August and September, every season, even if you're in a pennant race, sometimes you just sit there and say okay, I, I want to see what this kid has, and I want to give this kid an opportunity to, to get that big hit. Now, I'm not saying that that particular moment with Corey Lee, if we are in the middle of watching the White Sox go for the division, is a situation where, where Lee has got to be up. But you you can still use those situations, those learning situations, to your point about doing it while you're competing and how it never really should stop. And what the high school coach is doing there is sitting there going, I know I'm losing – my seniors, I know my juniors have only, you know, the end of this season, the next season before I got to, I got to rely on these kids, right? I got to see what I got coming up. And this is an opportunity for Pedro to see that even if Yasmani Grandal was coming back next year, you're trying to figure out who, who's next, right? Because Yas is, is not a 25 year old all-star. He's an old catcher at this point. So, and you're going to have to do that. Now this team happens to be a team of, relatively young veterans, but you would have to have the same, really the same conversations about some of your older guys like Anderson. You know, is he a guy that's getting too old? Elvis Andrews, we know, is getting too old to be on this team and and doesn't have a spot here. And you also have to identify what each guy is. Not all of these players match the money or the, the marketing investment that's been given to them over the last couple of years. And what Chris Getz has to do is walk in and say, 
Who is this player really? What are they in my lineup? It doesn't matter what was pushed on the fan base or what we thought they were going to be because I'm not responsible for the money and I'm not responsible for what happened over the last couple of years, but you are responsible now for looking at what you have and saying, this guy is this, this player over here is this, and this is what our need is. And you may have a need yourself. Let's say you want to keep mom and dad, grandma and grandpa out of assisted living, or you've had a surgery and it's hard getting around the house. Switch to a new age of life with Hyatt Home Medical Equipment. Uh, you can get around on your own, live independently with stair lifts, ramps, grab bars, lift chairs, and even bathroom remodeling. They are going to work with your insurance. They have 0% financing for qualified individuals. And if you mention socks in the basement, you get an additional discount. If you use a CPAP machine, and you're unhappy with your vendor, switch. Get your supplies directly mailed to you. They also have the latest in continuous glucose monitors. Learn all about them at hhme.com or stop in and see Hyatt Home Medical Equipment at 3518 West 95th Street in Evergreen Park. All right, Yohan Moncada is not a $30 million baseball player, but you're going to pay Yohan Moncada essentially that next year. It's going to be about $25 million dollars and then about $5 million to buy him out because you're not going to sign him for another $25 million the next year. So you're going to waste $30 million on this guy who's an above-average defender and probably is an eight-hitter. I mean, let's let's be honest. Right. Take away the hype. Take away the hope. Take away the, the, the status. The one on, outlier good season right. he had. And, and the status on all of those, oh, those prospect lists. What is he really? He's an eight-hitter on your team or a nine hitter on your team. He should never bat higher than seven. And and that's when he's hot. Maybe he's seven. And, and so you have to understand you have a, you have a third baseman who can play fairly good defense, who has to be buried at the bottom of your order. Who's going to get streaky once or twice during the year, kind of like Elvis Andros, but younger and far more expensive, but that's what he is next year. And possibly a better singer. I don't know how all of this sounds in the, in the studio. I, I don't know. I've never heard Elvis sing. Never seen him dance, never seen a video from him, but you have to wonder, would he be would he be about the same as Yohan Moncada? I don't know. Like, you have to identify that and look at that and say, that's all he is when you're planning your team. If you're penciling him in with a significant role in the top six spots of your lineup next year, you will not win a lot of baseball games, and you're, you're kidding yourself. And I was told that Chris Getz got the job because he already knows what the problems are. He's going to hit the ground running. And he's going to be able to make changes immediately, and he doesn't need to interview everybody, and he doesn't need to evaluate evaluate players. So he's got to be able to see that. And just like he's got to be able to see that, he's got to see something like Michael Kopech, probably not a starter. Probably a really good relief pitcher, probably not a starter. Probably not a – I mean, I think at this point the, the writing's on the wall as far as Michael Kopech. But th- that's the thing I think Sox fans are worried about with it being more of the same. And, and what the narrative about Chris Getz being more of the same has been is – that you don't want to see them trot out Michael Kopech in the starting rotation based on the hype of when he was traded for now five, six years ago, right? This, this ancient hype train about Michael Kopech being a number one type starter, he's never shown it in the major leagues. He's had opportunities to show it, and he continues to falter. Yohan Moncada, for, for all of the Yohan Moncada apologists out there, it's not that he's not a talented guy. He's got some talent, but for whatever reason, he just has not shown to be the impact transcendent player that we were told as a number one prospect in all of baseball when the White Sox acquired him that he was going to be. And the one really good season that people point to is now an outlier amongst multiple seasons. So if you're looking at it dispassionately and you're forgetting what Rick Hahn told us, and, and we should all forget things that Rick Hahn told us. Because he was um, wrong. Even if Rick Hahn told me the sky was blue, I'm going to forget about it and say it's purple at this point. But forgetting forgetting the hype train, looking at what has Michael Kopech done in the major leagues, he's not very good, except when he's in the bullpen. He's He's got some talent there. Yohan Mankata, you're right. Yohan Mankata is not the three-hitter on this team. He's not the two-hitter. He's not a guy that you can count on to be consistent with the, with the bat, to hit a lot of home runs, to steal a lot of bases. He can do all those things, but he does them in fits and starts. He's a streaky guy. He's not worth $25 million. You might be stuck with that, but you can still sit there and say, all right, you know, either yawn, prove it to me and work your way up the lineup, but you're starting this thing down at the bottom. You're starting as the nine hitter. And if, if Chris Getz is backed into a corner with Yohan Moncada and sitting there saying, I just don't, I don't have another option. I can't afford it until his money comes off the books 
or we just don't have somebody ready or something like that. We're gonna we're 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 stuck with Yoan for another year. And I, I'm sure he's not gonna say we're stuck with Yoan for another year. But he is. He's gonna sit there and say, you know, Yoan Moncada is part of this team for for at least this year, and and we'll see what happens when we go to pick up his option. But Yoan Moncada is gonna have to prove himself. Yoan Moncada, Zach Remillard, Elvis Andrus. Line up their stats as of right now, their average, their on base percentage, their OPS, their OPS plus. Just start lining it all up and look at them and how many games they played and everything. It's so so starkly similar. And yet, Yohan Moncada has been treated like he's something different. Two of those guys, you asked every White Sox fan, they would say that they don't really care if Remillard and Andrews come back. Right. Like Nobody would get upset about it. And Moncada, though, somehow was always elevated by the organization to be something more than what he is. He's never going to be it. That's not what he is. If he proves you wrong, then you caught lightning in a bottle. But in the end, he is what he is. The organization, though, wanted Moncada su- to succeed so badly, they took a 30-plus home run third baseman who, sure, doesn't play defense as well as what Moncada does, but is hitting, what, close to 300 since he got to Miami and Jake Berger? And he's got over 30 home runs right now? Kenny Williams couldn't wait to get him out of town because of the, the light that he shined on the mistake that is Yohan Moncada. Right. I mean, that, that's a guy you could make the argument like, okay, he's in the middle of my order next year. He's going to contribute a bunch of home runs. He's going to continue to develop because this was really just his rookie year. You don't have that with Moncada. Moncada is what he is. He's the same as all the, as, as those other two players. That's his value. That's all he is. You're just paying him like he's worth more. And the same thing goes for Anderson. Like, is he worth $14 million next year or whatever it's going to be? It's right around there, I think. He, he might be. He hit 240 at the, to this point with a 580 OPS. And yes, he's shown some signs of life. He still only has one home run on the year. That, that's something that also has to be weighed. Like if you had a better class out there of shortstops that you could go into free agency and get, I would say don't even pick up the option and spend the money on someone else. Give somebody a one-year prove-it deal or just like, you know, grab a journeyman and stick him over there at short because you're just waiting for Colson Montgomery to get here. That's another question, like, what is he? I love T.A. in his prime. I want the guy to succeed, even with all of his flaws and the warts that surround him. I, you want him to succeed. It, we're a better team when he's playing well and he's up at the top of the order. Is he that anymore? And, and, and the argument that Getz is going to have to have with himself in the mirror, because he's the only baseball voice, it's not, it's not Kenny and, and Rick arguing with each other while Jerry just slips his head into the office every once in a while and goes, but I got an idea myself that's completely different from what you two guys have. Supposedly, right. it's just Gets. So he's going to have to have this argument with himself. He's got he's to look at this and he's got to say to himself, okay, what does it benefit us in 24 if he comes back? Even if he has a great year, will it get us into the postseason? Do we even have enough that we can spend in capital and can I make other moves to improve this lineup? So I do want to bounce back Tim Anderson, and it's really going to matter. Or does it really not matter if he bounces back or not? And he's definitely gone the year after that. So it's time to it's time to just start changing the direction of this ship right now. And, and sitting there saying, yeah, and, and sitting there saying, thank you, Tim Anderson, for all the things you've done right. for this team. And, and we wish you well, and we hope that now in your dotage as a Major League Baseball player, because let's face it, Anderson's over 30. This is where it starts for those guys. Um, you know, that, that you want to see Anderson go somewhere where, and if he, and, and to have success, right. And be part of a playoff team and do that, especially if the White Sox aren't going to be that next year necessarily. But again, to your point, if you're sitting there going, Hey, look, you know, I can do this, this, and this, and I think I can put together a roster that based on what the twins are and what the, the guardians are and, and the rest of the division, we we've got even even as flawed as we may be, we've got another puncher's chance next year while we're developing guys to do this. So maybe I will gamble on TA coming out smoking hot, being the TA of old, you know, competing for a batting title early on in the season and draw, you know, bringing us closer to the promised land of getting back in the playoffs and, and having kind of like what's going on on the North side where a team that's really not expected to, to, to compete, Tim Anderson becomes Cody Bellinger. It, you know what? What the the Cubs are getting out of Bellinger this year? Yeah, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there's kind of like the bounce back, and it's the rejuvenation, and it's the knowing exactly. that I'm going to be a free agent next year, and uh, like I, I can't wait to get out there and just prove it because I'm not done with my career. Like, yeah, you might you might actually, and get I'm going to get exciting baseball out of the way for these fans, and we're going to bring this team closer to the playoffs than they've been. Mm-hmm. 
Hailstorm Brewing Company is the official brewery of Socks in the Basement. They have a scratch kitchen. It's now open 11 a.m. for lunch on Tuesday through Sunday. The uh, smoked wings are the best thing on that menu, but everything on it is really good. They have shareables. They have things that can be for meals. Uh, you get out there, they have specials uh, during lunch. It's a great place to get together. It's a big German beer hall. It's got the entire brewery working all day long, and the tap room has been upgraded recently. Uh, the outdoor patio is, is great with the fire pits. They get live music on the weekends. Uh, this is a brewery you want to visit. If you're going beer hunting, they have a lot of selections, and they're always changing it up over there. Their brewer, Will Turner, is one of the best on the south side, if not in all of Chicagoland. Uh, Tinley Park, 8060, 186th Street, right off of 80th Avenue. Uh, you can see more at hailstormbrewing.com. Now, here's the thing. When I look at this roster, it, and it's hard to look at. It really is. It's actually visually difficult to look at this roster. It is. Like, I, get, it I get a headache. You have a center fielder who's an all-world superstar. And, and it's going to be right there in the middle of your order. That's the, that's a benefit that you have. And, and might actually still have some some room to ascend. Yes. You have a left fielder who's a professional baseball player. For whatever his and flaws are. And who is what are, he is, but that's fine. He is. I mean, he drops a ball every once in a while out in the outfield, and he's going to be you know slightly above average hitter. And But he's he signed now for the next four years, and he's not your problem. You have plenty of other problems than Andrew Benintendi. You have an Eloy Jimenez who this is probably it, Right. Like, if he's healthy, he contributes. If he's not healthy, who knows? I, I don't know what he is. If somebody came along and offered you something for him and you were like, you know what, I think I can remake this team and we can get things going really quickly with a quick turnaround, maybe you move on from him. But he's at least a middle-of-the-order hitter. So I've named three guys that are going to bat in your top five. Somewhere in the top five spots of your order, you've got three. And then I would put Vaughn in the sixth spot. Andrew Andrew Vaughn is another one that's an interesting one because this was the, this was the offensive savior that was going to come up through the draft, and to this point he has struggled. I think when you're talking, I think he's the poster child for why you have to cast a weary eye towards Chris Gatz in some ways. But yeah, but he did he didn't get a chance to develop him. Well, that, that's my point is that when you're when you're looking at Chris Gatz and saying he didn't develop anyone. He's really left with the guys that are at the bottom of the barrel in terms of uh, talent or have major holes in their game or flaws because the guys that are the first and second round picks, Rick and Kenny would just rush them right on up and through yeah. and not give any anybody an opportunity in the minors to really spend time with a guy like Andrew Vaughn. And so when we're sitting here, we're still waiting for Vaughn to arrive. Now, a few seasons in, that's where you start to get into this he is what he is kind of a thing and... Is he going to develop 40 home run power? I don't know. It's not looking like that. I would say he probably tops out as a 25 home run a year guy. Is he going to be a 300 hitter? He might hit 270. I, I, I think he might be. I think he might be Andrew Benintendi with 20 home runs. He might be Andrew Benintendi with a, with a little bit more power, and and he might be able to develop a little bit better in terms of being able to take a pitch, uh, work the count, and yeah, be maybe, maybe a little higher on base percentage, right? And he may work himself from being a six hitter into being one of your top five guys in your lineup. Uh, but I don't think he's ever going to be like this. It, he's not Paul Canerico no, 2.0. No, he is not. But what you what you are missing then is you don't have anything at catcher. You're missing you're missing at least two top five hitters in your lineup. You, you have no catcher. You don't have a catcher. Right you haven't figured out second base. You no. aren't sure what you're doing with Anderson at short. Uh, Oscar Colas, show me something. I'm still waiting. You know, obviously, you are a spectacular Triple A player, and and is overmatched right now. And that's, I mean, you could say Jerry's still out. You don't know what he's going to be, but you you want to know what you're doing in 24. I'm not counting on that guy. No, I, I that that's a now that's the flip side of the of, of it too. Is you know, Getz may not be able to send Andrew Vaughn back down. You may not be able to unring that bell. But if if I found out coming out of spring training next year that they're sitting there going, Oscar Colas is going to spend most of this year in the minor leagues working on like these five things. And we'll see if he ever comes up. I wouldn't be sad because I've seen him. You're right. I've seen him look completely overwhelmed and overmatched right. in the majors. Right. And then you have a starting pitcher in Dylan Cease, who's probably more of a two than a one who is, has fallen off this year. And uh, you know, he's got, and even if he gets good again, remember Scott Boris is his agent. You've only got a couple of years, and right? Then, and then yeah, he's going before and then he he's becomes going. really expensive. And you don't have anything else really that I'm excited about in your rotation. So you have to completely rebuild your rotation. And this is why I think I I've I've really noticed this since getting the job. 
Chris Getz has stopped saying compete in 2024. We're going to get better. And then we're going to get better beyond. I've heard him say things like that. Well, and that's that's a law, that's a goal. Be better next and year. And that's a good thing because I'll I'll tell you something. You have to you have to realize Well, you couldn't be worse. <laughs> there's so many holes in the roster that like it's not unless Jerry's spending, which he said he isn't, okay? There's so many holes in the roster, and that's why at this point Stop playing guys that aren't going to be on the team anymore. Get together with your manager. Make sure he understands which way the ship is pointing and which way you want him to steer it. And if he starts doing his own thing or he just isn't mentally capable to keep up, replace him. On the phone line with me right now, Dave Marin. He's known as the Sox Nerd. He is a guy who puts these incredible tidbits and trivia up on the scoreboard at the rate he's been doing it for so long, and he's nice enough to join us on this program, and he's brought to you today by the village of Lamont. Want to experience a downtown with real history, great eats and drinks, and green spaces filled with adventure? Visit the village of Lamont, shop, dine, drink, explore, and see everything they have going on this month, including a massive Oktoberfest over at the Forge, Visit LamontDowntown.com. How are you, nerd? Fantastic, Chris. How are you? I'm hanging in, buddy. What do we got? Chris, let's talk Timmy, shall we? I think I have a way to return Tim Anderson to his former greatness. Somehow, T.A. has to be convinced that every team he is facing is the Detroit Tigers. If only hypnotist Harvey Mizell, who was enlisted by the 1983 winning Ugly White Sox, were still around. Anderson emerged from the weekend hitting 352 in his career against the Tigers. Among players with at least 228 at-bats against Detroit, only the great shoeless Joe Jackson at 389 has a higher Sox average versus the Tigers than T.A. In terms of overall history, Anderson ranks fourth all-time in average against Detroit behind shoeless Joe, Wade Boggs, and George Sisler. Among those he is ahead of are Gehrig, Carew, Speaker, and Ruth. And good news for Tim. The Sox play in Detroit this weekend where he totes a 358 average, which is a team record at Comerica Park, and the second highest by a Sox player in the Motor City behind Ray Durham's 388. A strict diet of lefties would help Anderson, too. His 327 average against Southpaws is second in Sox history to Frank Thomas's 331 in the complete records era, which dates to 1954. T.A. has been consistent with both of these splits. He has hit at least 318 versus lefties in seven of his eight seasons, and he's hit at least 397 against Detroit in each of his last six campaigns. And a little something on Miguel Cabrera, who played his final game in Chicago on Sunday. Miggy played his first game at Guaranteed Rate Field in the first National League game at Guaranteed Rate Field. On September 13, 2004, the 21-year-old Cabrera was one for three in the Florida Marlins' 6-3 6-3 win over Montreal in the first of two games moved to then-named U.S. Cellular Field because of Hurricane Ivan in Miami. The next day, Cabrera hit the first of his opponent record 26 homers in the Sox current home. My zinger? With 13 steals in 14 attempts, Andrew Benintendi has an outside shot at leading the American League in stolen base percentage. Should he do that, Benintendi will be the first Sox player to lead the league in stolen base percentage in 14 seasons. With 25 steals and 27 attempts for a sterling success rate of 93%, the last Sox player to top the league in this department was Chris Getz in 2009. That's it. More than you wanted to know about TA, lefties, the Tigers, Motown, Miggy, and stolen base percentage. All eyes on the new GM because he's got to make a lot of moves internally, externally, with coaching, with players, and Pedro's got to be on the same page because if he isn't, you can't sit there and say, well, I already I already promised him he'd have next year, but we'll reevaluate at the end of the year. No, no, don't do that. I was told you could hit the ground running. You didn't have to have a lot of meetings. You knew what needed to be fixed. So, so do that, all right? Because uh, otherwise, there was no justification of you getting one of the most coveted positions in all of professional sports and that is general manager in singular voice on a Major League Baseball team. 
yeah, forget what franchise. I, there's there's millions of people who would take that job for any franchise, even even one that has, frankly, that has watched their reputation fall as fast as the White Sox. But but you know, this is all we can do is hope is hope and hope and hope that Chris Getz is what he's been described to us as, right? And based on what we've talked about today, I mean, if you think about it, this this roster that we were sold a bill of goods on and told was a World Series caliber roster. You and I have just spent in the last half hour, even slightly less than that, going over it and realizing that if next year, if next year you had... Luis Robert, Andrew Benintendi, Dylan Cease, and a completely different cast of players. Like, just everybody else on the roster had completely turned over. We wouldn't be shocked or dismayed by that because you don't have anybody else to hang your hat on beyond the professional left fielder, the all-world center fielder, and the guy who's probably a two or three in your your rotation. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on SocksInTheBasement.com.